Hello and welcome to North Lancashire Live. It's lockdown live. It's day 332 um, and we're still in lockdown but the end appears to be near as vaccine rolls out across Scotland. Um, in news today, the Alex Salmond evidence that was submitted to the committee has been approved to be released and published by the committee despite it being published all over the internet last week. Um, but more importantly, North Lancashire Live is running a crowdfunder. Yep. We've got the big and bowl out. Uh, we desperately need some cash to keep this sort of programming going and improve on it as we go along. What we're hoping to do is very in the run up to the Hollywood elections 2021 is we're hoping to have a, a digital hustings. Um, so the money that you donate will go towards upgrading the software to allow us to have eight candidates on screen at one time in a digital realm and allow us to have a hustings in the run up to Hollywood 2021. But tonight, we have Andy Doig um, from Scotia Future. Hello, Andy. Hi. Hi. Hello, Martin. Good evening. So could you just give us a little bit of background of what Scotia Future is? Okay. Scotia Future is a party that was formed last October. We believe in real independence and a Scotland of equals. Uh, we believe in a Scotland that has its own currency, its own central bank. Um, we're a party that believes in economic justice. We believe in a free, fair and enterprising Scotland based on cooperative principles. We believe in diversity. We believe that um, it's very, very important that communities like Lanarkshire uh, have their say. And we think that one of the big problems with devolution has been in the last 20 years is it became very, very centralised. and. It, it now looks as if it's becoming almost like a mini Westminster. So the three key points that we believe in are real independence, a Swiss-style deal for Scotland and EFTA rather than the EU. Um, secondly, we want economic justice uh, based on, on corporate values. And thirdly, we want um, more power back to communities and to local government. Right, so that's a, that's a lot to unpack in one statement. Um, it is. So you are standing for Holyrood 2021. Now, are you standing as a list party or are you standing as a constituency party or are you standing as both? We are standing, Scotia Future is standing as, as both. Uh, I've been uh, chosen to stand for Scotia Future in the Renfrewshire South constituency. I'll also be standing on the West of Scotland list. And the party leader, Chick Brody, is standing in the Air constituency and he'll be standing on the south of Scotland list. Now, there's a lot of um, pro-independence parties that are, are kicking about at the moment, uh, but the majority of them are only standing on the list. Um, the reason being that, you know, standing on the constituency vote theoretically will split the vote. So that's, I mean, that's the, the argument that's going to be levelled at you um, over the coming months that you're... You know, it's going to become very Monty Python, I think, uh, in your inbox and in your comments online. It's going to be Judean People's Front and all these accusations. So why stand against the SNP um, when th they're seen as the party of independence? Well, but are they, though? I mean, it's really sad, I think, what's happened to the SNP in, in recent years. Um, fundamentally, uh, Chick Brody and I left SNP were, because we were tired of the authoritarian culture promoted by the current SNP leadership and their denial of real independence and democracy, because it, that Scots should be allowed to choose their relationship with the EU, not be told we're automatically going back in. I think it's about respect for the 35% of yes voters who voted to leave the EU and the 38% of all Scots who voted to leave the EU. And I think, can I, can I go, go further into this argument and unpack it a wee bit, Martin? Yep. I think if you, look, if, you, if you look at this closely, we are not Europhobes like UKIP, but neither are we Europhiles like the SNP. And I think Scotia Future sits with the vast majority of Scots, Scots sit in relation to the EU. We were quite happy. Personally, I was quite happy about the EU when it was a European economic community, when its, its basic role and dream it was as a commercial and trade-based organisation. But post-1992 and post the Maastricht Treaty, 
when it, it dropped the economic part of its title, it clearly wanted to become a political organisation with an, a, an agenda of ever closer European Union. I think that isn't really where Scotland should be. And, you know, I have to say as well, you get a lot of uh, um, commentators in the wider Yes movement, um, like Leslie Riddock and Alan Smith, who are continually, Alan Smith MP, who are continually holding up the, sh the shining example of, of Ireland and how well they do it at the EU. If you go back to the last uh, EU budget uh, and, and read the Irish Times, uh, the government in Ireland were lamenting the fact that they were being asked to pay more into the EU, but getting far less back. Now, I think the thing is, though, if you look at how Britain has handled Brexit, it's a disaster. Yeah, I think everyone can agree with that. Even people that are sure. pro-Brexit are going, this This is an absolute... Uh, I was going to swear there, but it's an absolute show. Um, so, <laughs> basically... Scotland outside the EU would have even less um, bargaining chips to get themselves a deal. Um, so you'd end up being the way that the UK is probably going to end up being anyway, where they're paying a lot of money and agreeing to a lot of stuff to be to be able to trade with the EU. But do you know what I mean? It's almost like going to be... Okay, I, th I can see in, in, in light of uh, recent events in the last month that, yeah, certainly, I mean, we, we don't want a Scotland, we don't want an independent Scotland that has no trade deal with the EU. What we want is a Swiss-style deal, which would is basically a tailor-made, bespoke deal that Switzerland has with the EU as a member of EFTA. EFTA also includes Norway, Iceland, uh, Liechtenstein, but they, they're not... Um, they don't have a, a trade deal, a, a, a specific trade deal, in the same way that Switzerland does. Why do we think Scotland should be in that position? Because Scotland, contrary to what we're actually always continually told, is actually fairly resource-rich, and um, we think that would put us in a, a key position. Scotland is in the middle of the North Atlantic. We can trade with Scandinavia, we can trade with England, we can trade with Ireland, we can trade with Europe. It's actually in a very strong economic position. And, and I think... Uh, that's what we've got to look to. We've got to look to building up Scottish sovereignty to get what's right for Scotland first. And I think that is the problem with ceding power to both, both to Westminster and indeed to, to Brussels, because there's, a, there's some significant problems in Scotland that we need to deal with. Issues that haven't been tackled, um, like poverty and the lack of social housing, for, for generations now. Now, of course... Um the, the Brexit thing can't be dealt with till you get the independence thing as well. So the, the, you can't really influence, because basically Westminster's dealing with uh, Brexit uh, and basically the, the Tory government is dealing with Brexit. There's not a lot of input from devolved parliaments or cross-party stuff. It's very much the Boris Johnson show and he's doing it. Sure. Um, so the, there's no way of actually tailoring that. And... So you need to get independence before you can even get to that bespoke thing. Now, this is where it comes down to the argument that's in independence first, and then we'll decide what kind of country we want. Um, where, where people will say, it, it doesn't matter what the policies are before independence. Once we get independence, that's when the game changes and the people of Scotland can make all the decisions they want to make anyway. Well, you see, uh, before 1999, I would have fully have accepted your argument. But the fact is that since devolution, we've been in a system which has got a PR system of voting. That's allowed a much more subtle form of political power to emerge in Holyrood. I mean, in 2003 to seven, you had what some people called the, the Rainbow Parliament. You had the Pensioners' Party. You had Tommy Sheridan, you had a few Greens, you had Dennis Canavan and Margaret MacDonald as extremely strong independent voices. Now, that's the kind of politics, I think, that Scotland needs. Now, but the, the fact is that after 1999, we've had a PR system, and I think that changes the whole nature of things. And I have to say, a lot of the, the, the fact that the independence movement is starting to grow and develop into other parties, that shows, firstly, the strength of the independence movement is actually starting to outgrow the SNP. And secondly, you're quite right, Martin, some of these developments ideally would have taken place after independence. But uh, the sad fact is, 
It's the kind of policies that the SNP have been pursuing in recent years, which are not mainstream policies, which has turned so many people and activists off the party. I'll just give you two examples. Um, the Gender Reform Act, which would remove sex-based rights for girls and women, and the, the Hate Crime Bill, which as it stands is a highly authoritarian measure, which is unlike any other hate crime legislation in the rest of Scotland. Now, I just can't sum up. There's two policies I can't sum up. I just think they're wrong. I think one needs radical reform. I think the other should be put to one side. But I think it's, it's it, because it's the, the Gender Rights Act, I think, is far, far too um, extreme a measure. Um, that's one issue. I think, I think we, 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 we discussed the, the Gender Right Act a little bit on the show. Um, and I think the main problem is um, that it's not discussed enough. That is our main issue with it. It's not well, being it's discussed, not discussed enough. enough because the, the problem was is the, the kind of authoritarian culture the SNP leadership have promoted. But I'd like to just talk about some of the other policy differences that certainly made Chick Brody and I leave the SNP. The SNP are pro-EU, the pro-NATO. Uh, they want pro-austerity e economics with their growth commission. Uh, they want tied to the pound for up to 10 years. Um, Scotia Future are pro EFTA. We want a swiss style deal. We'd rather be in partnership for peace rather than NATO. We want a Scottish currency as soon as possible, because if you don't have economic independence, you don't have political independence. Uh, we want a cooperative economy and a national programme of social house building. So there's a lot of key, key issues uh, that we think are, are tart in lines between Scotia Future and the SNP, and indeed maybe other parties like, like the ISP. Now, there is one thing that's, that there's an idea floating about at the moment, um, which is the, the plebiscite referendum, which people are talking about. Um, and it's being pushed, and people are trying to convince the, a lot of the parties like the ISP and the AFI are trying to convince Holly, uh, the SNP to actually go with a plebiscite referendum in 2021 in May. Now, if they were to say, yes, that's what we're going to do, we're going to do May 2021, we are going to have a plebiscite referendum. If we get over 50% of the vote in the constituency vote, we will declare independence. Would you stand down as your candidates? Well, I mean, Scotia Future, we decide to stand because we've got a, a distinctive policy offer, I think, to the Scottish people. We won't be standing down uh, for party reasons. But what we do value above all is we value discussion and dialogue around the broader issue of independence, and uh, because that's a priority. Unless you have independence, you're not going to have the economic powers of a government in Edinburgh which can borrow to deal with things like the COVID recovery. You're just not going to get there. And I think if COVID has shown anything, Martin, it's shown that we need the powers of a full government. When I was in the SNP, I fought numerous parliamentary elections on their policy at the time, which is if there was a majority of SNP MPs in Westminster, that would be taken as a mandate to negotiate. So I, I don't have any difficulty with, with that uh, as a policy, none, none whatsoever. Um, I think the important thing is, there's, there's three points I think I'd like to stress here. I think all pro-independence parties should make clear in their manifesto that if a pro-independence majority is returned in Holyrood, then that will be a, a democratic mandate for a second independence referendum. Another two points I'd like to make is the Smith Commission allowed, allowed for a further referendum and did not prohibit it. But I think the most important point I'd like to make to the Once in a Generation gang is that the Good Friday Agreement, which is an international treaty, allows for a unity border poll every seven years in Ireland. So I'd just like to ask why, the Tories need to tell us why in this precious union does, only, does one part have to wait 40 years while another part only needs to wait seven years in order to decide its own future. Now, you guys, uh, when did you form? When did the party form? It was October, October 2020. Now, are you standing across all constituencies? I think um, I think it will probably be the case. I think uh, that we'll be standing simply in the two constituencies at the minute. Um, yeah. We've been the, the COVID crisis has affected our ability. Uh, we are picking up new members. We're picking up new increased traffic in social media, and we're picking up new attention like this interview. 
but the, between the COVID crisis and the, the electoral commission uh, delays, which which took took us up to six months just to register, um, I think because of these factors, we've decided to play to our strengths, and that's why we're fighting just the air and the Renshaw South constituency. So, who are your two candidates? I, I assume you're one of them. Myself and the Renshaw South constituency and the uh, Trick Brody, the former MSP who's the party leader, he is standing in the air constituency. Right. So I don't I know it's it's early doors, but what do you think your chances are? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think there's everything to play for, really. Uh, I mean I've got a very strong profile in the constituency. Uh, I stood I work in the constituency, live in the constituency, worship in the constituency. Um, I stood for Renshaw South in 2011 for the SNP and came a very close second. I uh, only lost out with two, two and a half thousand votes. Um, since that time, I've been a, an elected councillor for two thirds of the, two thirds of the, um, well, sorry, a third of the, the constituency. So I, I think I've been a very hard worker. I've been a good representative, I think, by any any standards, and uh, I think it's there's all to play for. Cool. Now we were talking about you were talking about currency there, so that's that's one. If there was a referendum, I would take it you you your party would try and campaign as part of any independence referendum and get involved in the independence referendum. Now you're talking about yes. having um, Scotland's own currency. Yes, now, sir. what would that be? How? Why are you opposed to the the? Pro the pragmatic idea of saying, right, we'll stay with the pound for 10 years and then we'll gradually transition. Well, is it pragmatic or is it naive? I think it's the latter rather than the former. Uh, I mean, we can look back to lessons in history, Martin, about this. If you look back um, to when the Irish Free State formed in 1922, it took them about five years to develop their own currency and about another 10 to fully uh, get out from under the wing of the, the British Treasury. And they paid a very, very heavy price for that, albeit it was in the 1930s when the world economy was in a very bad state. But the lessons are there to be learned, and the lesson is this. If you don't have economic independence, you can't influence politically the policy of the, the Bank of England, then you don't have, politi you don't have um, political independence. Without economic independence, there's no political independence. You can't manoeuvre, you can't change policy direction, and that's what you need to do. And that's why a currency union, which, I mean, you know, Westminster rejected it in 2014, they'll reject it in the next referendum as well. That's why a currency union, while on this, in the face of it, it might seem reasonable, it's, it's just not good for Scotland or indeed England in the long term. I mean, to be fair, when we talk about currency, and this is this is the the weird thing, um, when I remember when the independence referendum, and it was like they'll take away the pound, and uh -huh. and people people actually did mistake that there were some people that mistake that they would actually physically take away your money, um, sure. Um, so there's there's confusion when when you start slinging things about currency. Basically, Scotland, as I know, people will will say this is like the oil's running out, and yes, it is running out, but Oil's traded in dollars. So if we were going to use anyone else's currency, probably dollars would be the better better option just because it's tied to one of our main industries. That, that's not an unreasonable point. I mean, I, can, I say, <laughs> can I say I'm not an economist? I mean, my working background is in, 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 is in social care and uh, I've got an honours degree in divinity, so I'm not in any way qualified to talk about numbers. But what I can say is... Recently, there was in fact an economist I noticed who said that a, a good holding position for independent Scotland might be to adopt the Norwegian krona. Now, I'm not, I'm not qualified enough economically to say would that be a good bet or would it not. Um, we could adopt the Canadian dollar, uh, given the, the, the strong Scots connections with Canada. Um, we will need to have a holding position, that's for sure. Um, but I think the key point is it will be a holding position rather than a permanent currency union. Um, if you're asking what would it what would it be? Well, I mean, let's say the pound score. I like to call it the pound score because it just kind of it kind of rhymes off. Um, the Common Real, the um, the pro independence policy group, have developed some extremely extremely decent 
proposals and very, very uh, in-depth proposals, how you'd actually move move to an independent currency. And um, I think in terms of what they've said, they think the best choice would be between a pound score that's got a basket peg to sterling, which would be set against a range of currencies rather than one and also provide stability for business. Or you could also have a free floating pound score where the market sets the price of the currency. Uh, but you need to make that clear pre-independence that this was the main option because that would give the markets time time to adjust. But I'd like to make another point because it's often thrown at Scotland that we, we, we just don't have the uh, we don't have the reserves. Um, you know, we need to have billions of reserves here in, in GDP. Uh, Dr. Jim Walker, who's a leading Scots economist based in Hong Kong, he's made the point that you don't need to have 20% of GDP in reserves because in, 1960, uh, in 2016, both Australia and New Zealand were three floating currencies, only had reserves of 4.5 and 10% respectively. So an independent Scots pound, it won't just survive, it'll actually thrive and prosper. I mean, there's also the, I mean, I've seen it got thrown about as an argument before in terms of if, if Scotland became independent, it would be, a time to be bold uh, would be to go with cryptocurrency and just say, do you know what, lead the world and make uh, a cryptocurrency the currency of Scotland. Just get away from cash completely. Just wipe it off the, the boards. And, and then that's certainly an option when you're, you're setting up to a new currency, because any new currency, there are going to be teething problems. Um, I don't, I, I don't think uh, necessarily that we, we can go into much detail tonight, but there is that. Anything that no. you're going to do when you're changing the currency, there's always going to be issues. There's going to be dips in your economy. There's going to be problems with it. Um, there'll, be but, political issues. there'll be political issues, Martin, and there'll be economic issues, but there's, there's certain issues that will not change or never change. It will never change the fact that England will be a major trading partner, uh, partner for independent Scotland. And, and incidentally, you know, can I just add as an aside to your earlier question? One of the reasons why um, the Scotia Future favours an EFTA position is if the SNP want to take an independent Scotland back into full EU membership and England is still firmly out, that would then create a hard economic border that wouldn't be good for trade and business. Um, so I think, you know, um, at the end of the day, England will still be a big trading partner. I think uh, Europe will still be a big trading partner. I think what we need to do is look to build up more connections with Scandinavia and trade and commerce and industry. And I think how we do that is get back to developing some of the some of the Scottish ports that we used to have that in, in centuries past were extremely well developed, who, who traded with Holland, who traded with Scandinavia and Denmark. And I think that is something we really need to get down to. Now, of course, all this is completely hypothetical because we've not even got a, a referendum on the horizon at the moment. Um, one of the big things that's come up in, in the press is obviously Martin Keaton's court case, which um, was rejected at the first hurdle, but then it has gone back on appeal um, about the Scottish government's right to have a, an independent, a legally binding independence referendum um, without the requirement for a Section 30 from Westminster. Now, how do you feel about that? Do you think that that's something that should be pursued uh, vehemently, that we Scotland should be able to hold its own referendum without having to ask uh, Westminster whether or not? Or do you think, no, these are in place to keep us, um, so we're not having neverendums, as it were? Right, OK. I mean, well, there's one thing, let's get one thing clear. Um, <laughs> The Scottish people are a sovereign people, but our sovereignty is indivisible. Um, we don't need to ask the world's permission or anybody else's permission to decide what we want to do as a country. We're a democratic system with a long tradition now, 200 years of, of, of uh, emergent democracy. Um, we're a developed country economically and politically, and if we, can, if we can do what we want to do. And in fact, as far as Martin Keating's case, I applaud Martin Keating and I applaud the effort, time and money that he's, he's undoubtedly put into this case. And I wish him extremely well on that. What worries me a wee bit about the position that's been promoted by um, the, the SNP, this, this new 11-point uh, um, plan that they've come up with, I don't think it's so much a roadmap to independence as a roadblock. Um, there's no time scale. 
there's no penalty clause for Westminster that doesn't concede to a second referendum in the long term. And I think this is absolutely crucial. To give Westminster an open-ended timescale in which to respond to the legitimate and democratic demands of the Scottish people, if they vote, if they vote for pro-majority independence parties in May, is absolutely naivety in the extreme. It's naivety in the highest. Begging to the UK Supreme Court of Brussels, as the SNP leadership want us to do, is, is entirely futile. And it's actually it's wrong and it's dangerous because sovereignty doesn't lie in Westminster, it doesn't lie in Brussels, it resides here. If you want to look to any international court of appeal, we need to look to the United Nations and uh, appeal directly to the, the UN Secretary General to stand on the principles that are enshrined in the UN treaties that the UK is a signatory to regarding the right of national self-determination. That's what you need to do. See, this is where it gets confusing because there's this, whole, there's this whole argument as well that the UK is not a country. The UK is a union of four countries. Um, that's that's usually the, the thing that gets bad because I mean again we live in a world of the internet uh, where we have uh, part-time lawyers who, who who go on Twitter and say you know what the union was um, a voluntary thing and Scotland can leave it at any time it chooses they don't need to have a referendum as long as the government of Scotland says we don't want to be in this union anymore and there is kind of you can hear it, but you don't know the legality of it um, in terms of because you sort of think, well, Westminster didn't have to ask if we wanted to leave the EU. They could have just done it. They didn't have to have a referendum. Yeah, they might have lost the next election if it was a bad move and people didn't want them to do it. But a government's in charge for f five years. Um, they can do what they want during that time as long as they have the votes within the government. Um, so you. When you talk about testing the the Section 30 thing, testing whether they can have a referendum, you almost think they should push a little bit further and test whether do we actually need to have a referendum if if Scotland decided, if the the majority of politicians in Scotland decided, do you know what, we don't want to be part of the UK? Well, I mean, most, most countries in the last uh, century, Martin, uh, that became independent from the UK, the Commonwealth or the British Empire as it originally was, didn't use a referendum mechanism. What they did was they, they convened they had a national ballot and a majority of pro-independence parties were elected. They then convened a constituent assembly, national assembly, which then put that deal to the people and then the first government would be elected. Now that's an entirely uh, clear and democratic process. It's highly legitimate. It's not in any way discreditable or disreputable. Um, it's the policy, can I just add, it's the policy that the SNP fought elections on for 52 years. <laughs> so for them to say, or for people to say that the Section 30 is a gold standard, that was a product of the politics of uh, 2012, 2013. That's never going to come again. We only got Section 30 because the Tories didn't think there was a snowball's chance in hell of winning the independence referendum. And I don't think, I think it's quite dangerous to go uh, begging to the, the authorities in Westminster. That's not what the Scottish people, we've got more respect in that as a people and as a society. And can I just read out to you to clarify some of these points? Yes. Yeah. The United Nations believes uh, in the, the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which is a UN international treaty that Britain signed in 1976. Part 1, Article 1 quote, recognises the right of all peoples to self-determination, including the right to freely determine the political status, pursue their economic, social and cultural goals, and manage and dispose of their own resources. This is an international treaty that the UK signed. If Boris Johnson and the Tories turn around and say no, then they're, they're breaking international law. And the yes movement in the yes community in Scotland should make that clear to the international community. There should be a campaign to form an international unit led by the wider yes movement, not by political parties like Scotia Future MLs, led by people like Val McDermott, Alan Cummings. It should be made up of businessmen, trade unionists, former parliamentarians, people of influence, to make the case uh, internationally that Scotland has a right to do that. 
The Yes Movement can do that now. We don't need to wait for anybody. Yeah, I mean, um, that's what, I mean, again, it all sounds fantastic. It's it's all up in the air. Twenty twenty one. That's this is the year where a lot of things get decided. I think it's crunch time for the independence movement this year. Um, either it, it moves forward or it, it probably will stagnate and 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 flow back. Now, for yourself as a party, um, are you hoping to grow? Um, because as you said, you've only got two standing this year. But are you looking to you know, in the future, well, 2026 would be the next one. Sure. Um, is, is that thing where you're saying, right, okay, if we don't go here, are we going to go for the next Westminster election? Are we going to go for council elections? Are we going to go for the next Hollywood election? Is Well, okay, well, I can, can, can answer these points. Mark, they're very good points that you're putting to us. Of course, we want to grow, we want to thrive, we want to prosper. Um, as yet, we've, we've, we've decided amongst ourselves as a party, we don't particularly see, because our key focus is on independence and the powers that flow from independence, because independence in itself is an abstract concept. It's not about changing flags, it's about changing society. Independence is important in itself, but it's only what you can do with independence, and that's why it's an important and key issue. As yet, we haven't decided, we're not particularly keen on fighting either Westminster or local elections. We want to focus on the Scottish elections because we see that as the mechanism, the mechanism constitutionally, that we can actually regain our independence. But we do hope to thrive, we do hope to prosper. We think we've got a unique offer to make to the Scottish people um, because of our, our, our focus on cooperative policies. We're a cooperative movement. We look back, unlike other independence parties, we look back to the history of the Highland Land League, we look back to the cooperative movement that clothed in, in uh, generations of working class people in Scotland. We look back to these kind of values, but we also believe cooperation entails the use of the market mechanism. We're not there. I would say that, where do we stand? I would say that um, parties like the SSP which are, and the Solidarity, which are, I respect their position, to me, they want to abolish the market. The SNP wants to just acquiesce with the market. We want to radically reform the market. So I think we've got a unique position in Scottish politics. And I think as time moves on and we get independence, uh, what we've got to offer, how to, the policies, the kind of policies that we have to build in New Scotland will become apparent. Now, again, you're a very, very small party. Um, don't take that the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> I'm not small trying to tell you. Small but perfectly formed. Yeah. Um, so, how would somebody get involved with um, Scotia Future? Okay. Well, we're seeing increased uh, traffic on our website. Um, people can join via the website, like most other political parties. You can sign up and join there. Um, we've got social media. We've got a phone number. Um, people can get to find out about it through the the, the normal channels that most people use these days, which is, which is social media. Yeah, so I mean, I take it at the moment, obviously, during lockdown, you've had to do most of your stuff via online conferencing and video conferencing, yeah? We've had to, I mean, this is just, I mean, it's necessary, very necessary, because the, the COVID, the COVID pandemic has just been, I think, such a drain and a strain on, on uh, on societies and governments and countries, it really has. Um, the kind of things that we would have did normally for a party launch, like we, we wanted to have a launch in every city in Scotland, we wanted to really get out there. Uh, Chick Brody and I are, are very much both people persons, we like to meet people, we like to chat, that's why I'm delighted to be here tonight. Um, that the, the restrictions we made that extremely difficult, so we've not been able to branch out the way we wanted to, but in the long term, we think it's good for Scottish democracy to have a number of different voices, um, and that's what's important. That's what democracy is all about. Well, it's been great to talk to you. Um, hopefully, uh, we might get you on um, nearer the elections. I know you're not standing in North Lanarkshire, but we are planning hustings um, um, for for the run up to Holyrood 2021. Um, sure. 
I, I don't think, uh, I mean, you might have a candidate by then that's standing in North Lancashire. Somebody might have seen this just tonight. Just never know. Just never know. So, thanks for coming on. Okay, thanks very much, Martin. Thanks for the invite. Good night now. So that was Andy Doig from Scotia Future, a new party started only just last year um, and they're planning on standing in Ayr and Renfrewshire. Now, next week we've got another political party on. We're going to have another chat. I know last week I misspoke and said Marion Fellows was going to be on this week, uh, but that's just me because uh, I'm an idiot, um, as you can probably tell from the way I interview most of the politicians that come on here. But I will remind you, again, on the page we do have a crowdfunder. We are looking to enable ourselves to be able to have an online hustings in the lead-up to the 2021 election. Now, what this does will enable you to speak and interact with your local candidate online rather than have to go to a church hall or go to a community centre, which might not be possible in the run-up to the 2021 election. So it gives you an opportunity to interact online. What we'll do is we'll take Twitter feeds, we'll take Facebook feeds, we'll broadcast it on Facebook, we'll broadcast it on YouTube so that people can interact and comment and ask questions as we go along. Um, we'll be, if we reach our target, we should be able to have uh, eight candidates on at any one time, which is more than enough and gives you an opportunity to meet your local candidate. But until next week, I will say good night.